Last time in this series, I talked about homelessness. And one of the things that makes homelessness such a difficult problem to address is that it's the result of other problems which are also difficult to address in their own right. Of the underlying problems I mentioned, one of the most challenging and damaging is mass incarceration and the vast and complex constellation of issues that are attached to it. But for as big and seemingly intractable as it is now, like chronic homelessness, mass incarceration is a fairly recent problem. Today, the United States has both the largest total prison population and the highest rate of incarceration of any country in the world. But the expansion of the prison population to its present level didn't really begin until about 50 years ago. That's not to suggest there weren't serious issues with the American penal system prior to that. There were. The need for prison reform has been an ongoing issue since the founding of the country. Questions about what to do with people who have been convicted of serious crimes, where to house them, how to treat them while they're incarcerated, and what, if anything, society owes them once they're released have been subjects of debate for centuries. The fact that incarceration is the default punishment for most serious crimes is itself a result of one of the earliest prison reform movements in the United States. Reformers in the late 18th and early 19th centuries considered imprisonment to be a more humane form of punishment than forced labor or whipping or public humiliation or the various other punitive measures that were still commonly employed. The first penitentiary systems were developed in the 1820s in Pennsylvania and New York, and while the methods employed in those early prisons, constant solitary confinement in the Pennsylvania system, and mandatory silence and marching in lockstep in New York's Auburn system seem obviously cruel to us today, most people at the time considered them a humane alternative to how prisoners had typically been treated up until then. And the ultimate aim of these measures was not to punish prisoners, but to instill discipline, which, it was thought, would lead to rehabilitation. Prison reform movements continued to push for changes in how and when incarceration was imposed and how prisoners were treated throughout the 19th and 20th century. Crusaders like Dorothea Dix push states to create separate systems to deal with mentally ill people who fared especially poorly in penitentiaries. They often weren't treated much better in state asylums, but at least it was a start. Practices like parole and probation were introduced. Living conditions within prisons were improved. Somewhat. Of course, these improvements weren't entirely motivated by humanitarian impulses. The legislators and administrators who supported them were also concerned with saving money. Prisons are expensive, and there has always been a large and vocal cohort of Americans who believe that the government ought to be spending as little money as possible. That desire to cut costs would give rise to one of the two major factors driving the massive expansion of the prison population these last few decades, the privatization of prisons, but I'll get to that a bit later. The first major factor driving the expansion of the prison population in the U.S., and arguably the most important, is something that began in the early 1970s, the war on drugs. Like I said, while prisons in the United States have never been what I would call good, mass incarceration wasn't really an issue until about 50 years ago. And what happened 50 years ago was President Richard Nixon... Actually, can I just stop there? I think I can. President Richard Nixon, that's what happened. Okay, I'll keep going. What Nixon did specifically was push for changes in federal law that reframed drug addiction as a law enforcement issue rather than a public health issue. Drug abuse was a widespread social problem in the 1960s and 70s, but to Nixon and those of like mind, the solution to the problem wasn't increasing funding for treatment programs or addressing underlying causal factors like poverty. To Nixon, drug abuse was the product of a moral failing. Drug addicts were bad people and society needed to be protected from them. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, as of 2016, 
15% of inmates in state prisons and 47% of inmates in federal prisons were convicted of drug-related offenses. Most of those are for drug trafficking, so it's likely, all other things being equal, that many of those people would have gone to prison with or without the war on drugs. But then again, it's also likely many of them wouldn't have, and that those who did wouldn't have been given as lengthy of a sentence. Not everyone who engages in drug trafficking is Pablo Escobar. Most aren't. In fact, no one except Pablo Escobar is Pablo Escobar was Pablo Escobar, I should say, because that dude is hella dead. Anyway, the war on drugs that began under the Nixon administration was carried on to varying degrees by every president that followed, even the Democrats, I am sorry to say, though Jimmy Carter did at least try to decriminalize cannabis. Thanks, Mr. President. It was a nice thought. New, harsher drug laws were passed throughout the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, and those laws included mandatory minimum sentences for those convicted. One of the most important reforms to the penal system in the early 19th century was the introduction of indeterminate sentencing. After a jury delivered its verdict on the facts of the case, if that verdict found the defendant to be guilty, it was up to the judge to determine the appropriate punishment. A judge's power to pass sentence wasn't unlimited, of course, then as now judges were bound by the law, but mandatory sentences for particular crimes weren't nearly as common. Now, that system wasn't perfect either, and Jesus, I would never suggest that the solution to the twin problems of penal reform and criminal justice reform lie in returning to how we did things in the 1800s, but the absence of mandatory sentences meant that a judge had room to exercise some discretion. If a judge felt a particular case warranted some mercy, they had the power to impose a lighter sentence rather than a harsher one. Justice under many of our current drug laws is far more binary and therefore harsher. A defendant is either not guilty and allowed to go free, or guilty and subjected to a lengthy prison sentence, often without the possibility for parole, depending on the severity of the offense. The explosion of the American prison population since the 1970s is largely the result of the increased criminalization of drug use and the imposing of mandatory minimum sentences. But that's not the only reason. Now let's talk about privatization. In the 1970s, as the prison population in the United States began to increase due to the war on drugs, so too did the creation of private prisons. Private prisons have existed in the United States since the 1800s, and in fact were quite common up until the early 20th century, when most states banned the practice of leasing prisoners to private companies. This, like other ostensibly positive examples of prison reform, was ultimately driven by the profit motive. It's not so much that states were concerned about how inmates at private prisons were being treated, more that they saw how much money private prisons were making thanks to having a cheap in-house labor force, and they wanted that money for their own treasuries. Following the advent of the war on drugs, states across the country began to have a change of heart. Their prison populations were growing faster than they could build new prisons to house them. So contracting private prisons made sense. But while the rising rate of incarceration due to the war on drugs opened the door for a resurgence of private prisons, that door was kicked in by an obscure federal program and a powerful right-wing lobbying group called the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC. If you've paid much attention to conservative politics in the United States over the years, you've probably heard of ALEC. It writes model bills and then shops them to state legislatures around the country. If your state representatives have debated or passed a draconian abortion law or harsh new immigration policies in the last couple of decades, chances are good that legislation was based on a model prepared by ALEC. Beginning in the early 1990s, ALEC began pushing various versions of a piece of legislation it called the Prison Industries Act. The act was designed to encourage states to take advantage of the federal government's Prison Industry Enhancement Certification Program, or PI, which had been created in 1979. One of the requirements of PI was that prisoners who were engaged in manufacturing products for private companies were to be paid the prevailing wage. 
with the allowance that states could withhold a reasonable percentage of inmate wages to offset the costs of their room and board. Alex's Prison Industries Act allowed states to evade this prevailing wage requirement by specifying that withheld inmate wages could be placed in accounts, which could also be used to pay for the construction of new facilities and for recruiting new private companies to make use of prison labor. The stated justification for all of this was to give prisoners the opportunity to contribute positively to society during their incarceration and to ease their transition back into society once they completed their sentence. The actual result of legislation like the Prison Industries Act and the passage of even more mandatory minimum sentencing laws throughout the 1990s, most of which were also pushed by ALEC, which, by the way, is sponsored by Corrections Corporation of America and Geo Group, the two largest private prison companies in the country, probably a coincidence, was the tremendous explosion of what is commonly referred to as the prison industrial complex. Companies contract with private prisons, which provide cheap labor to manufacture goods for the companies, which makes lots of money for both the contracted companies and the private prisons, which creates an economic incentive to lobby for the passage of legislation that would result in putting more people in prison so they can increase their cheap labor force, make even more goods at lower cost than they could otherwise, and make even more money democracy and ruthless, amoral capitalism working hand in hand to make people who are already rich even richer, or, as it's also known, the American dream. So that, in a verbose and somewhat reductive nutshell, is why mass incarceration is such a problem in the United States. Now the question is, what do we do about it? And the answer to that question is, let people out of prison. Okay, so that's also reductive. I'm not suggesting we just unlock the doors and let everybody out of prison. That's ridiculous. But I do think we need to start encouraging our representatives in Congress and our state legislators to start thinking about practical ways to reduce the prison population. That means phasing out the reliance on private prisons. Sorry, morally bankrupt profiteers. You'll just have to go back to exploiting workers in other countries, I guess and rolling back those mandatory minimum sentence statutes. It also means creating a more robust and reliable support system for former inmates, so that in reducing the prison population, we don't greatly increase the homeless population. It also means restoring to prisoners who have completed their sentences their constitutionally guaranteed right to vote. According to the Sentencing Project, there are over 3 million Americans who have completed their prison sentences who have not had their voting rights restored. I actually don't have an objection to revoking a convict's voting rights during their sentence. Almost every state practices a form of felon disenfranchisement, and I'm okay with that. It's punitive, but prisons are inescapably punitive. Even the most progressive prisons are established to exclude people from society, and that exclusion can include the temporary loss of certain rights, such as the right to vote. Maine and Vermont allow prisoners to vote by absentee ballot, and I'm okay with that too. What I'm not okay with is prisoners not getting their right to vote back once they've done their time. 18 states, including my home state of Maryland, I'm happy to say, automatically restore voting rights to prisoners once they're no longer incarcerated. Another 20 automatically restore voting rights to former prisoners once they've completed the terms of their parole or probation, which I'm also more or less okay with because parole or probation means that your period of incarceration is over, but not necessarily that you've completed your sentence. The remaining 10 states require some or all felons to petition to have their voting rights restored. And that I'm not okay with. When a convict has served their sentence, we often say that they have paid their debt to society. If that's true, and I think it should be, that means that they should regain the rights they lost during the term of their sentence, including the right to vote. And they should regain it automatically, not only after they jump through the mandated bureaucratic hoops.
A convict having paid their debt to society also means that when they are released from prison, they're given help reintegrating into society, finding housing and a job, given the support they need to begin their lives over. I personally think our society is oriented too much toward competition and not enough toward cooperation, but as long as we are forcing people to live their lives like they're running a race, former prisoners should at least be allowed to start at the starting line, not a mile behind everyone else. Reducing the prison population and setting up a support system sufficient to enable released prisoners to return to society and not find themselves homeless or compelled to commit further crimes that will just find them back in prison is going to take time. But to really solve the problem of mass incarceration, I think we need to be pushing for reforms that are even more far-reaching and long-term. It's not enough to figure out what to do with the people we have incarcerated now. We need to come up with a better system for how to handle people who are incarcerated in the future. And that should include redefining what we mean by incarceration and whether or not we even need to be doing it in the first place. Here in the United States, we've grown accustomed to thinking of incarceration in terms of punishment. You do the crime, you do the time. It's about making the convict suffer for their offense. This is what's called retributive justice. It's been the prevailing philosophy regarding how to deal with criminals in the United States for pretty much the entire history of the country. But there is another way. Restorative justice, in contrast to retributive justice, emphasizes rehabilitation of criminals and reconciliation between offenders and those harmed by their offenses. And this isn't just a nice-sounding idea. It's actually been tried at the national level in several countries. And it works. One of the most cited examples of a country with a penal system that operates under principles of restorative justice is Norway. To get a sense of how drastic the differences are between the prison systems in Norway and the U.S., you only need to take a look inside a typical Norwegian prison. For example, this is Halden Prison in southern Norway. Halden is a maximum security prison. Its inmates include murderers and violent sex offenders. Cells in Halden Prison are spacious, equipped with a TV, a refrigerator, a desk, a private toilet and shower, and unbarred windows. Prisoners have access to a kitchen and a comfortably furnished common living area. They're allowed to have regular visits from family and friends, and if it's that kind of a visit, you know what I'm saying, they're allowed a private room. And the prison even provides condoms. The prison itself has few of the security features we Americans have come to expect from such a facility. There is a large concrete perimeter wall, but there's no barbed wire, no guard towers, no electrified fence. There are surveillance cameras, but most of those are positioned outside, not in the living or work areas. And the grounds of the prison are laid out like a village, with brick and steel buildings, grass and trees everywhere. The vibe the place gives off is still unmistakably institutional, but compared to most prisons in the United States, it seems downright pleasant. So, Coddling their prisoners like this has been a disaster for Norway, right? The country is overrun by violent criminals. Actually, Norway has a significantly lower rate of both violent crime and overall crime than the U.S. Its rate of incarceration is 75 per 100,000 compared to over 700 per 100,000 here in the U.S. And it has one of the lowest recidivism rates in the world, while the U.S. has one of the highest. Prisons in Norway focus on rehabilitation, not punishment. They prioritize preparing prisoners to return to society. But there's more to Norway's correctional system than humanely designed prisons. In keeping with the philosophy of restorative justice, the Norwegian criminal justice system also favors sentences other than incarceration. Convicts are sentenced to community service or rehabilitation programs that they can complete outside of prison, which means they don't have to leave their jobs, homes, and families in order to complete their sentence. Would a system like the Norwegian model, with its preference for alternative sentences and its laid-back, comfortable prisons that prefer rehabilitation over punishment, work here in the U.S.? I kind of think it would. According to the Prison Policy Initiative, 
45% of inmates in state prisons and a whopping 94% of inmates in federal prison were convicted of nonviolent offenses. Is there really no better way to deal with these people than to lock them up? And for those who are violent offenders, who do need to be incarcerated as a matter of public safety, wouldn't it be better to at least try a system that has been far more successful at rehabilitating criminals and keeping them from committing further crimes once their sentence is complete than what we have been doing? Look, we may never get to the point where we can do away with prisons altogether. Even in Norway, there are some criminals who are so violent and so resistant to rehabilitation efforts that they do just have to be locked up away from everyone else. Ela Prison, located outside of Oslo, houses many such prisoners, and it looks a lot more like what we Americans might expect a maximum security penitentiary to look like. But Ela is the exception rather than the rule. It has a maximum capacity of 124 inmates, which accounts for a tiny fraction of the total number of inmates in the country. The Norwegian model seems effective in the overwhelming majority of cases. And look at how low those rates of incarceration and recidivism are again. You can't argue with results. I mean, you can, and people do, and people also just ignore them. It's clearly an option. It just doesn't make any sense. unless. Your goal is to keep more and more people in prison to not only expand the profitability of the prison industrial complex, but also maintain the fiction that the only way to respond to crime is through overpowering force and harsh, unforgiving, punitive measures. So you can then paint anyone who questions the effectiveness or morality of such measures as soft on crime and exploit that perception to win elections. But that's silly talk. Why would anyone do that? Anyway, the point is this. Can we completely abolish prisons? Probably not. Can we mostly do away with them and fundamentally reform the ones we have left so that they are centers of rehabilitation rather than punishment? Yes, in time, I think we can. And I think we should. So what can we as individuals do to help make this happen? One thing we can do is to get in touch with our members of Congress and our state representatives and let them know we support prison reform and restorative justice. And not just because it's more humane, but because it works better than the system we currently have. Those of us who live in states where felon reenfranchisement isn't automatic should also be pushing for that to change. And we should also be pushing our representatives to expand support programs for recently released prisoners and make sure those programs are adequately funded. Beyond contacting your government representatives, you can support organizations like the Center for Justice and Reconciliation, which promotes restorative justice programs and educates people on why restorative justice makes more sense than retributive justice in so many cases. And you can educate yourself on this issue, so you can also educate others. One of the biggest barriers to significant prison reform and reducing mass incarceration in this country isn't political or economic, it's cultural. Thinking of criminal justice as necessarily retributive and of criminals as people who need and deserve harsh punishment is a deeply entrenched norm that will take time to change. But it needs to change. And in order to change it, we need to persuade not only our government representatives, but each other, that even if prisons are a necessary, if regrettable institution in our society, they don't need to be brutal, they don't need to be full, and they should absolutely never be part of a profit-making industry.